the time over to her. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me this morning. Um, I know being the first one is, um, you know, can be challenging. People maybe don't want to get up early, but thanks for being here. Um, so I just wanted to share today with, about my dissertation research and um, talk to you about what I found out. Um, I was interested in looking at teaching strategies in the planetarium and whether or not they were present and to what level they were present. And specifically, I'm looking at one particular um, kind of method, which is um, assessment conversations, and I'll talk more about that. So let's dig in here. So um, the main reason for this research was to graduate, but also um, that uh, I really wanted to serve my um, K-12 audience the best I could. And the way I thought about doing that was to really make the planetarium an extension of the, the classroom and really reinforcing what the teachers are doing in, in their classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, you know, being someone who's interested in interactivity, I really wanted to make my interactivity um, serve more purposes than just engaging my audience, but also to help them learn better. And so I looked at modern teaching strategies and active learning seems to be at the forefront of um, teaching these days. And um, specifically, I wanted to really focus on something that would be easy to implement in the planetarium. Um, it wouldn't require additional technology or props or anything. So I really wanted to focus on things that we were already doing in the planetarium. And that was to focus on the conversations and the questions that we ask of our audiences. And so, from active learning, I kind of focus down to formative assessment and assessment conversations, which I'll talk about more in a little bit here. So active learning, um, research says that it's the best way to teach because it really reinforces things and it leads to longer retention um, and really improves student learning, um, specifically if it includes formative assessment. Now, formative assessment is um, assessment for learning. We'll talk about that here. We, uh, oh, not yet. I'll go back. Um, so it's the contrast is summative assessment, which most of us are familiar with, which is um, kind of like an exam or a paper or a presentation at the end of a lesson or a section. Um, so you're gauging what a student has already learned. Whereas formative assessment is when you are finding out what they're learning as they're learning it. So you're able to really guide your teaching based on what they understand and what they don't understand. So that you're spending more time on the things that they are struggling with and not as much on the stuff that they're really, they've really gotten. And so you're not surprised at the end saying, oh, I can't believe they didn't understand this. I thought we all understood this um, when you give the exam or something. Um, and so you're learning with them along the way. So active learning in the planetarium has happened before, and it does happen. Um, so originally, um, Friedman, Schatz, and Snyder developed this, what they called the POP pro uh, programs, the Participatory Oriented Planetarium. Try saying that five times fast. Um, so they s kind of changed gears from the traditional star talk, which was you know something we often refer to as the sage on the stage, um, and so really interacting with their audiences. And they found that that really did help um, with learning and retention. Um, additionally, Jeannie Bishop also took some ideas for, from the classroom and implemented them in the planetarium and was also very successful. So really the idea here is that the planetarium really can be thought of as a modified classroom. And so there's no reason that we shouldn't be taking um, research tested um, ideas and, and pedagogies from classrooms and implementing them in, in the planetarium classroom. So a formative assessment, as I mentioned, is an assessment for learning, not of learning. So it's a way to provide feedback to the students and to the teachers. And so this way you can adjust and modify as you go. Um, kind of like uh, choose your own adventure in the planetarium. A lot of us like to do those types of things, or we like to let the audience guide the, the experience. However, in this situation, we're focusing more on um, guiding the experience based on their understanding as opposed to based on their preferences. So we're really focused on trying to get them to learn as much as we can while we have them. So specifically, there's lots of all, all kinds of different types of formative assessment, but the thing that I'm focused on is the strategic questioning or the assessment conversations, because this is something that, you know, we all 
when we interact with our audiences, we ask questions. So why not use those questions a little more specifically or a little more targeted and see what we can do, help our audiences learn a little bit better. So this is my research, theoretical framework, whatever. This just shows that I did all my reading and I know that it's based on some sound stuff. You can go back and look at it if you want. But the thing that we're gonna focus on here is um, this assessment conversation piece and what we call the ESRU cycle. So the ESRU cycle is a way to really um, kind of analyze an assessment conversation to see how, basically kind of judge the quality of an assessment conversation. Are you really getting to the, to the root of the understanding of that student? And so the ESRU cycle is really the focus of my research. So this ESRU cycle was developed by Ruiz Primo and Furtak. And what they did was they, they studied assessment conversations in STEM teachers, um, in, STEM, in STEM classrooms. I think it was like middle school typically. And so what they did was they developed this kind of coding scheme. So the E stands for the teacher eliciting a response. So you're asking a question. We all do that in the planetarium. The S stands for the student response. Okay, so the student, someone in the audience or many in the audience say something back to you. You need to recognize, the teacher recognizes their student response so that they know that they've been heard and their contribution has been recognized. And the important part here is the U. The teacher uses that student response to guide instruction and to further their, their teaching. Um, what Ruiz Primo and Furtak found was that teachers typically didn't get to this using part unless they had specific training. So this using isn't exactly, doesn't come naturally, I guess. Um, and so I wanted to know whether or not we were doing this type of thing, these assessment conversations, and whether or not we were getting to this using stage in planetarium presentations. So that's this, the basic idea of the study. I wanted to find out whether or not these assessment conversations were happening in planetariums, in planetary presentations, and to what level they were happening. Additionally, I wanted to know if there were any kind of factors that were um, influencing the amount or lack of um, assessment conversations, complete assessment conversations that I found. How I did this, well, so here's my questions, basically just saying what I just said nicer. And so what I did was I requested um, recordings from planetarium presenters across the United States. And I listened to these recordings and basically applied this ESRU coding to these recordings. So, so I listened to all the, the recordings and wrote down all the questions and um, tried to see if there were any um, ESR, complete ESRU cycles. Additionally, for each of these presenters, I had them fill out a questionnaire so I could get some information about the presenter themselves and their dome environment, as well as the show that they were pr presenting. The second stage of this study was semi-structured interviews in that I took, I asked some of the participants to talk with me about um, some of the factors that um, kind of influence their level of interactivity and active learning usage, usage in the, their planetarium presentation. So this I'm going to skip over really fast because I don't have a ton of time. Um, but you can always go back and look at these. Everything is uploaded, or I sent everything to Michelle. Um, but this gives you an idea of the types of um, domes that I um, got recordings from. Most of them were digital and unidirectional, and the largest subsection was um, a smaller domes. The research participants, I had 26 individuals um, provide recordings for me, almost half and half male and female, and ranged in experience from one to 40 years. Additionally, the show types that um, they presented, the majority were for school groups, um, and they ranged in length from 15 to 80 minutes. Um, for In that situation, I um, actually normalized them to 30 minutes so that everybody would be on an equal playing field. It, for the interviews, I conducted eight interviews with um, individuals at various levels of the complete ESRU cycle, use, so the using, um, and looked for any kind of themes that came out of that from uh, in how um, different things might have affected their amount of interactivity and active learning. 
what I found. Here's the results. Yay. Um, I listened to more than 26 hours of instruction. Um, and there were lots and lots of questions asked. And of those questions, very, very few um, actually got to that using stage. And this was not surprising because as I mentioned, Ruiz Primo and Furtech, when they were um, working with teachers, they rarely got to the using as well because they didn't have any training specifically to get to that point. So the majority had low to no ESRU, complete ESRU cycles. So you can see here kind of broken down a little bit better. Um, 20 of my 26 were zero to two and we had two outliers that were kind of higher and then a few in the middle here. Um, but there really was not a whole, there was lots and lots of questions, lots and lots of, lots of ex assessment conversations, but no complete ESRU, or not very little complete ESRU cycles. Um, in addition, I took that data and compared it to all of the demographic information that I collected from the questionnaires. And you can see the different types of things that I asked about. Um, and there were no relationships that I could find between any of these demographics and the ESRU level. So there was, I, for example, I kind of thought that maybe for a longer show, you would have more time to ask questions. And so you would see more complete ESRU cycles. That wasn't the case. Some of my longest shows had very few to none in there. So it really didn't ma matter what kind of, um, or how long the show was. Um, additionally, I thought maybe the dome size, maybe if you're in a really big dome, it's really hard to connect with your audience and so you ask fewer questions. Well, one of my highest using ones was in a very large dome. So there were really no indicators here on, or influences on what was happening with the ESRU cycles. So overall, very few um, ESRU, complete ESRU cycles happening and no really observable correlation between any of the demographics and that result. So, okay, maybe it has something to do with the presenters. So let's look at the um, interviews. Overall, what I found from the interviews was that um, surprisingly to me, at the time, but now in hindsight, it's not as surprising. Um, the presenters in general didn't seem to value the teaching as much as they did to inspire or engage and kind of, and I don't know, inspire, I guess, um, their audiences. So that was surprising at first, but thinking about it, that's a lot of pressure to put on us when we have an audience for a very short amount of time. And so many of the, the presenters said that, you know, I don't want to try to teach them everything that they need to know. I just want them to be curious. I want to ignite that curiosity so that they'll go back and learn the stuff that I can't cover everything in this little bit of time, which totally makes sense. Um, additionally, some of the presenters said that they use their interactivity and their active learning strategies more as classroom management um, to keep people in their seats, keep them awake, um, keep them from poking their neighbor, whatever the case is. Um, some of the presenters mentioned that, you know, one of them specifically said, I don't know what I don't know. So talking about the third bullet point here, there's lots of different types of interactivity and active learning. And maybe I just haven't learned about these, this specific um, method yet. Additionally, of course, we're all constrained by time, way too much stuff to cover in a tiny bit of time. Um, so that makes it difficult and it's, it makes it seem like you can't ask all those questions that you'd really like to ask. So now I'm gonna stop talking and I want you to talk. We don't have a ton of time, but I would like us to think about, I'd like you to think about, do any of these apply to you? What do you think, um, do any of these stand out to you as being problems that you see or things that you can relate to? You can put it in the chat if you'd like, or if somebody wants to, to pipe up and say, hey, yeah, no, that makes sense, or no, you're way off on this one or anything. Uh, yeah, Donna from Dallas. Um, yes, I am glad to see this because I've been in the field since the 60s, but I do it a little bit different. I'm in a very small school district, so I do K through 12, and having them every year really helps to continue the learning search. But one, thank goodness you did call it a field trip. It is an extension of the classroom. Two, I only cover what those teachers coming want me to cover in STEAM. 
Highland Park includes the arts. I wish everybody did. It's S-T-E-A-M here. And I like what you've said here. You're following up what I've done for a long time. Classes are small, there's a lot of interaction, and the teachers want certain objectives that day. So I don't have two third grade classes that might want, the teacher might want the same thing. It's very personalized and I'm lucky it's a 30 foot dome. And I'm glad to see everybody. It's been a long time. I'll be quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. I would concur with Donna. However, um, my teachers don't even know what they want half the time. So I have to kind of give it to them. Um, a lot of them are coming at the end of the year because it is a field trip. Right. So, and I try to educate while they're there, <laughs> whether they want it or not. I gotta say, I'm jealous of all the um, school in in school planetarium folks or folks who who have their planetarium as an extension of other classrooms and other forums because I feel like I am a babysitter slash daycare worker slash summer school <laughs> runner when when the students come and um, for a good two years there was my part time staff running all the school shows while I did all the background uh, material with him. Uh, with all the, all, I, I really focused just on the structure of everything, so I had to teach them how to engage structure, uh, discipline, so to speak, both the teachers and the students, especially the teachers, because when I'm there, they're on a field trip, they're wild as the kids sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to train part-time staff to do this on a regular basis and somehow not get slapped mostly just verbally in the face by uh, all the teachers and, and still get amazing, uh, you know, thumbs up. And these are people very, very new to informal education. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, this is John Keller from Fisk Planetarium. Um, we're doing similar research around how faculty, college faculty are using the theater in their lecture environment versus in the planetarium environment. And I think it's really interesting that your study is focusing on, I'm guessing, veteran planetarium, well, people who are, who are spending much of their time in the planetarium uh, compared to our faculty, which I think, you know, they, they're coming into the planetarium for one or two days per semester. And I think there's definitely a lack of training and preparation for those faculty to modify what they're doing. They're doing very active learning engagement in the classroom, in the lecture hall, based upon the reforms in astronomy education. But, but they, we, ha we haven't provided tools, resources, and professional development for faculty to transition that that active learning into the dark dome environment. Yes, so we'd love to talk to you more about those different groups of, of how, how we train our professionals as well as faculty. That sounds fantastic. Yes, thank you. All right, so seems like there's an opportunity. I, I'm sorry to cut anybody off, but we can definitely talk more. Um, I only have 11 minutes left, so I want to have more conversation about a little bit different. Um, but it seems like there's an opportunity to help us kind of be able to use our interactivity and our engagement strategies to not only inspire our audiences, but also to really work on trying to help them learn um, and help them retain what we're talking about, even if it's just a couple pieces out of what we're teaching. Um, and so what I want to know, um, that's my plan. My plan is to um, develop some sort of a professional development opportunity for planetarians and for instructors too, um, to be able to do this. There's lots of other things that came out of this research that you can do too, and you can talk to me about that later if you'd like. But this is my goal, is to maybe, to create this professional development opportunity. So, this is now your turn again. I'm not gonna talk anymore. Well, I'll talk a little bit, but not much. Um, and so what do you need? Number one, is this of any interest to you? So if you could either put something in the chat or like raise your digital hand or something, um, is this something that you would be interested in learning more about? Do you want this to become an opportunity for you to be able to learn more about it um, and to be able to enact it in your um, planetary presentations as well? Um, because I don't wanna go ahead and do this if nobody's interested. <laughs> So um, it looks like many people are saying yes in the chat. Great. Um, anybody have any ideas about 
Um, what kinds of things you need? Well, let me go to the next slide here. What do you, what do you, what would you want out of a professional development opportunity like this? What would you want it to look like? Um, what would you need to, to be able to do something like that? What would keep you from being able to participate in something like that? Um, Jessica's asking, does your thesis include any examples of the groups who did complete? Yes, yes, actually. So I'll jump ahead. Thank you, questions. These are some, <laughs> at the end here, I have two examples of complete assessment conversation cycles. So you see that it gets to the U here and the U here. And then these are incomplete ones. So they just kind of ESR, 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 um, back and forth. So you'll be able to look at those um, after the fact uh, when Michelle shares out um, what, what these slides. In addition, my, the slides that I um, sent to Michelle have all of my graphs and data and stuff that I just skipped over um, that you can take a look at if you'd like. But I figured in the interest of time, we wouldn't bother with that. Um, Astro 101 workshop sponsored by JPL. No, I never did attend that. Is, is that something similar to um, what I'm doing here, maybe? So I'll just um, pipe in for a second. Sure. So they were primarily gearing their uh, techniques toward instructors in the university slash college classroom because their research showed, obviously, as yours has shown, that uh, uh, a certain type of engagement with the students led to higher uh, levels of learning. And so their goal was to go out and uh, emulate for instructors and give them practice and how to bring that learning into the classroom. And so I think there's maybe some overlap between some of the things that you're researching and the work that they've been doing for some years now. Okay. So I just thought you might want to check that out. Yes, thank you. And building off that, Ben, I think it's it's largely about, you know, providing opportunities for practice, but guided opportunities and the reflection, which is, you know, kind of development that we all know about. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions, comments? We've got seven minutes. I can Go ahead. There would be a technical question about just the incentivization for uh, for planetariums to send presenters to be part of professional development. Um, now, clearly, there's a benefit to the planetarium, but but will facilities, especially the small facilities, have the resources to send and engage people on face to face face to face professional development, or would would there be other mechanisms to make that viable? So one thing that we've thought about is providing or developing like modules that would be available online, maybe through the IPS website or something like that. Um, because I have had some people tell me, you know, I'd really love to have my team in my planetarium be able to see this and utilize it as well. Um, so the idea is hopefully um, to have it available in different methods, different modes, so that people who, like, you know, people who can't come to a conference or come to, you know, take a day off for, for a workshop or something, they can actually at least have something to work with. So yeah, definitely. I'm trying to read through some of the um, chat here. Yeah, Michael, that would be fun. Um, I think that would be really a great opportunity to do um, an entire e-conference in the fall where you can walk us through examples live with real participants. That would be a lot of fun. All right, so one thing I want to mention is that I did um, put together a little bit of a questionnaire to, to kind of, it's kind of a needs assessment. Um, and I'm gonna put a link to it in the chat. So if you would go to that link and just fill it out, it'll take you maybe a minute and a half. Your questions are easy. Um, but it's just a way for me to kind of gauge interest and kind of have something to show like, yeah, this is actually something that this many people are interested in doing. Um, and in that is also a, a link to this presentation um, recorded that I recorded for um, 
I think for IPS actually. Um, and so you can find it there as well. But um, if you could go and fill out that survey or questionnaire, that would be super helpful um, because then I can um, say, yeah, we should definitely do this. <laughs> so if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and um, email me or find me otherwise. Um, yes, I am considering doing an e-workshop as part of Virtual Blippa. I have not heard anything yet. Um, about what's happening with workshops for Glippa, but I'm hoping that I can at least present something on this, um, if not, if not a workshop. So, um, any other questions? I'm going to stop talking now. I have a question. I think Patty might want to join up on. We want to gang up and do what you did. Um, so, what kind of program did you go through? Was that an online program? How did you go into this PhD line? Um, so, it, yes. I, my PhD I received from the University of Wyoming, and it was a completely online program. Tim Slater, um, right? <laughs> Tim, yes, with Tim Slater. Yes, he is my love, my advisor. love him. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, it was completely online. It took me a while because you know life. Um, I had three babies in the time that I was doing grad school, um, but it is stuff is geared towards people who already have careers. Who are doing this in addition to all the million other things that they're doing so um it's definitely it was definitely the perfect fit for me perfect because i'm at that stage now to look 